I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. From the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Sabetic come many of the incidents in this unusual story. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Sabetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. There was a time when the word peace was included in the approved communist vocabulary. And there was a time, only recently, when that word was replaced by another. This is the story of that time and the other word. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews at Matt Sabetic, Undercover Man. Now, here is Dana Andrews as Matt Sabetic, Undercover Man. This story from the confidential file is marked Violence Preferred. Here, listen to this. The Communist Party and capitalism can cooperate over a long period of time, and eventually the revolt of the proletariat may be attained by peaceful means. Strange talk these days, isn't it? But at the time I joined the Reds for the FBI, that was the official party line. Then, a few years later, something happened. Something that turned the latent disease of communism into an actively vicious crippler. An epidemic intent on polluting the world of free men. It happened at a big party convention when the word of the Communist International became the law of the Communist Party USA. message from our comrades in the other parts of the world must be heeded. You, in America, must again become the party of struggle, the party of revolt. <laughs> the teachings of Marx, Lenin, and our exalted leader, Joseph Stalin, have shown us that it is impossible to overthrow the power of capital by peaceful means. This can only be achieved by a revolutionary violence against the bourgeoisie, by a revolution that crushes the resistance of the exploiters and creates a new classless communist society, a dictatorship of the proletariat. <laughs> Pretty, wasn't it? And it really happened, right here in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Then, to help start the new red ball of terror rolling, the Communist International sent missionaries to America who carried the word to all parts of the party apparatus. One of those missionaries was Leon Plevna, and I was assigned to escort Comrade Plevna to our district committee meeting. So, Comrade, revolution by peaceful means nearly defeats its purpose. It creates impatience, dissension. Well, Comrade Plevner, this, this new policy is a much greater risk to... The only successful revolution, Comrade Svetik, is revolution by force and violence. Well, let's not kid ourselves. A policy of violence here in America will force the party underground. So? We are underground, then. It's not that I don't agree, Comrade Plevner. Naturally, I don't doubt the theories of Marx, Engels, and Comrade Stalin. Oh, but... sit down, Svetik. You talk too much. <laughs> I'm trying to be realistic about this, Crenshaw. We're due for trouble, and we might as well face it. No harshness with Comrade Svetik, Comrade. He is honest. He speaks his mind. He can't have that much on his mind. <laughs> All right, Crenshaw. You win. No offense, Comrade. So, enough. I am instructed to tell you that all party records are to be collected and destroyed. Our membership cards, too? Everything. 
All incriminating evidence must go. What about those documents you brought to us from Europe? They go, too. But they outline the entire course we're to follow. Places, assignments, the names of our most important leaders. Exactly. Such evidence, so vital, so important. Your FBI would relish it. It must go. Cell leaders have committed the essential points to memory. Now the evidence must go. Comrade Crenshaw. Me? Yes. I see you are a most aggressive cell leader. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Someone must be responsible for collecting the records, files, and cards from the cell leaders. You will do it. Well, say, I sure appreciate this chance. Well, that's a big job, Crenshaw. I'll, I'll be glad to help you. Help? No, thanks, Redick. It's a big job, all right, but I can handle it, comrade. You will collect all the files and cards and see that they are destroyed. You will do this quickly and thoroughly. Mistakes will not be tolerated. The enemy must not find evidence to incriminate us. Beaker. Beaker, this is Red. How'd the meeting go? Bad. Plevna wants all the party records destroyed. Membership cards, everything. What about the papers he brought from Europe? They go, too. Uh, that stuff is invaluable to the FBI, chum. You've got to get it for us. I tried, but Plevna turned everything over to George Crenshaw. Crenshaw? A cell leader. He runs a crummy bowling alley on the edge of town. Can't you work with him? I tried that, too. No luck. Oh, we can't let them destroy those party records. Well, what can I do? I don't know. But try to do something. Anything. Okay, big girl. Don't try. That our boy. And listen. Yeah? Be careful. We need the evidence, but we need you more. I knew how much Beaker wanted those records for the FBI. These were papers direct from the files of the Communist International, brought here by Comrade Plevner to acquaint American commies with the work of their overseas comrades. The big reds here and abroad were named. Facts and figures were documented. In the hands of the FBI, it would be a potent weapon against subversives. But George Crenshaw, not I, was collecting the files to be destroyed. I had to learn where the files were now and how to get them. So I headed across town to Crenshaw's bowling palace. Check your hat, kiddo. Hmm? Oh, oh, no, no thanks. How about your coat? No, sorry. How do you expect a bowl with all them clothes on? I'm, uh, I'm looking for George Crenshaw. Oh, friend of the boss, huh? Know where he is? Yeah, over there, Alley Six. Hey, Georgie, fella here to see you. Okay, I'll be right there. You'll be right here. <laughs> Thanks. You know, if all the guys who come in this joint kept their hats and coats on, I wouldn't make a dime. Well, I, I won't be staying long. It ain't the time, it's the money. You know what I mean? Come on, welcome to me, Katie. Yeah, him, the hat and coat. Hi, George. Well, Svetik, you old son of a gun. Didn't know you went in for bowling. Come on over here. I didn't come to bowl, comrade. I figured that. What's on your mind? Just a routine checkup, George. Got all the files collected from the cells yet? What's the matter, comrade? Don't trust me. We trust you, George. It's just that, well, as long as those papers exist, the party's in jeopardy. Well, now, relax, Buster. Relax. Right now, they exist in my office, right in my desk drawer. They're all there, even those European papers, all ready to be burned. Then why wait? Plevna wants to check through them before they're burned. Why are you so interested? I told you. Routine checkup. If I can help in any way... Help again. Now, listen, comrade. Plevler gave me this job, comrade. Me, little Georgie. It's a big job. It's my big chance to be a wheel, a big shot in the party. And you don't want to share the glory, that is? Right. This is my chance to shine, Svetik. All mine. Now, listen. I may look like a big, good-natured, happy boy, comrade, but when someone gets in my way, I get rough. Real rough. How rough? Rough enough to report you to Plevna. For what? I don't believe your routine checkup gag. Maybe you have plans of your own for those papers. Are you accusing me of disloyalty to the party? Not yet, but I might. Like I say, Svetik, when you get in my way, I play rough. At least I learned enough from Crenshaw to plan my next step. It was a big step, a drastic one. And it worried me more than Crenshaw's threats. Failure would mean disaster. But I had to take the chance. Um, 
Crenshaw's bowling palace closed at 2 a.m. At 2.15, I was across the street carrying a suitcase full of dummy cards, blank paper, and phony files, waiting for the building to empty. When all the lights were out and the street was cleared, I ran for the alley behind the gloomy building. I was under the fire escape now, one flight below the window to Crenshaw's office. The street was silent. The shadows were stationary. I tiptoed up the metal stairs, lugging that suitcase full of paper. Every step was a prayer that the window would be unlocked. It wasn't. It was locked. Locked tight. Only this pane of glass stood between me and the evidence that could incriminate a select group of rotten-hearted traitors. I had to get them somehow. Breaking that window was more desperate than daring. But I got inside. And just in time, too. Who's there? Anybody here? I hadn't figured on this decrepit building having a night watchman, but there he was. The beam of his flashlight poking holes in the blackness. The light danced up and down the fire escape, flipped across the window I'd just broken, then hopped around the alley below and blinked out. I was alone again and scared silly. No time to waste now. I took the blank paper, phony cards and files out of the suitcase and stuffed the commie papers into it, fast. There. Now to get out of here. I stacked the blank paper in the drawers where the commie records had been, and I ran to the window and opened it and shoved the suitcase out on the fire escape. Uh-oh, a visitor. I gave the suitcase a frantic push. It went hurtling down to the alley below as the door to the office opened, and the light hey, you, jumped on. Where? Comrade Svetik. I wasn't expecting you tonight. I wasn't expecting you either, Crenshaw. Just what are you doing here, comrade? You've heard of security, comrade. Of course. That's why I came back here tonight. That's why I'm here, too. Checking. My files? Me? That's right. Well, I'll just take a look. Hmm. All the papers and file cards are just where I left them. Now what, comrade? This is security? Leaving those important documents in an unlocked desk? No one ever comes into this private office except me. I did. So I found out. Come on, Buster. Where to? You and me, we're going to visit Comrade Plevna. Don't you think you should lock that desk first? Yes. Yes, I think that's a good suggestion. There he was, leaning over his desk. I had just started to pick up a chair when Crenshaw turned. Come on, Svetik. Let's go. Wait. Why the gun, comrade? Just to be sure I get you to Comrade Plevna. You've got a lot of explaining to do, Svetik. A lot of explaining. as Matt Sibetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI and the second act of our story. When you join the Reds as an undercover man, you're forced to live the back alley life of a commie and speak the festering thoughts of a traitor. But you walk carefully and alone. When you take action, it's bound to be drastic action. Very often, it's downright desperate. Maybe you do it to save democracy, but more likely, you do it to save yourself. My desperate action, though, wasn't saving anything. Those party records, so valuable to the FBI, lay in a suitcase in the alley behind Crenshaw's bowling palace. And I, I sat in a stuffy hotel room, facing comrades Plevna and Crenshaw, thinking wildly for an excuse, a reason, an alibi. So, Svetik, second story work does not become you. You have an explanation, huh? Yes, Comrade Plevner. A good one. Yeah, I'll bet it's a dandy. Look, Crenshaw, I've had just about enough Please, of your... Please, Comrade, the glory of the cause transcends these petty personal differences. Now, you, Svetik, why did you break into Comrade Crenshaw's office? He was after the party files, that's if why. Please, Comrade, 
All right, all right. It's true. I was after the party papers. We had put the entire party's safety in Crenshaw's hands. I went to check on his efficiency. But I was too late. Wh- what's that? The party filed all the papers. They're gone. Gone? Woman at Crenshaw, you alone were responsible for those records. Well, An explanation. Well, he's crazy, comrade. They're, they're right in my office, in my desk. The FBI got there before I did, I guess. The papers are gone. Well, I tell you, Svedek, you're crazy. That the stuff is in my desk. It was there when I caught you in my office. You'd better look again. There's nothing but blank paper. All of it. Nothing but blank paper. What? Is this true, Svedek? Check his office and see. Well, if it is true, you better ask Svedek what he did with it. Comrade Svedek did well to check your efficiency, Crenshaw. Come, gentlemen. We will see. <laughs> Back in Crenshaw's office, it wasn't pleasant to watch his reaction when he saw the phony papers and file cards where the party records had been. It was even more sickening to see him led out of the office by Tom and Pledna. But what could I do? Is it better to eliminate a red traitor with tactics approved by the Communist Party or to fail the FBI just to save the neck of a commie? Plevna took Crenshaw back to the hotel. What happened to Crenshaw after that, I just don't know. I left them there and headed back to the bowling palace, hoping that no one had found the suitcase in the alley. When I got there, dawn was hanging over that section of town like a wet, gray blanket. The shadows in the alley were shrinking fast. I went straight to the area under the fire escape where the suitcase had fallen. It was gone. I ran to the other side of the alley. I looked in all the corners, behind the garbage can, everywhere. Still no suitcase. I ran the length of that dirty concrete canyon, searching frantically. But it just wasn't there. It had probably been picked up by some well-meaning passerby. Hey, hey, you! What are you doing back here, huh? What's going on with you? Are you the, the watchman here? Yeah. Who are you? <laughs> I, I know it sounds silly, but... I lost a suitcase somewhere around here. You you didn't happen to see it, did you? Funny place to lose a suitcase, ain't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. You see, we uh, well, we, were, we were coming from a party, uh, a welcome home party for me. I just got into town last night. Mm. What about it? Well, driving by here, I guess we were feeling kind of giddy. One of the gang heaved the suitcase out of the car window. <laughs> you know, party and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know about them parties. Well, did you did you find it? Yeah. I found the suitcase, all right. You did? Oh, where is it? Let's get it. Keep your shirt on, son. How do I know it's yours? Oh, now, how many people come up to you claiming a suitcase in an alley? You ain't answered my question, son. Describe it. Well, it's it's about this long and this wide. And what color? Brown. Dark brown. It's got initials on it, too. M.C. That's me, Matt Savetic. Yeah, one identification. Well, I guess it's your suitcase, all right. Huh, let's get it, then. I, I can't. Why not? I locked it up. Where? In the check room inside the bowling joint. Well, can't you unlock it? Nope. Sorry, rules is rules. All lost articles get turned into the check room. Been operating that way for 18 years, huh? But I, I need the suitcase now. Oh, nothing's going to happen to it. The place opens at noon. No. Yeah, just go in and see Katie, the girl at the check stand. Listen, I've got to make a train in about 45 minutes. I've got to have the suitcase now. I thought you said you was at a welcome home party. Oh, oh sure, I, I was. But you see, I, I'm just passing through. I need that suitcase, Pop. Here. Will 10 bucks help with the rules? No, sir. Rules is rules. I ain't broke a rule in 18 years. I can't go losing my job just for ten bucks. Oh, for Pete's sake. All you have to do is go inside and hand me the suitcase. Is that a crime? Can't do it. A man has to have a little pride in his work, you know. I can't just up and sell out after 18 years of honest work without ever... Okay, okay. Isn't there some way I can get the suitcase now? Not from me, son. Better come back at noon and see Katie. She'll take care of you. Excuse me. You're Katie, aren't you? Yeah, kid, I'll be right with you. I... Well, if it ain't the boss's friend. Still wearing the same hat and coat, huh? Yeah. 
Well, you oh, gotta Katie, check I... them today. Warm in here this time of day, you know. Oh, uh, not this time. I, I came to pick up a suitcase. Suitcase? Now, the, the watchman found it outside last night. He said he turned it in here. Matter of fact, lost the suitcase, huh? Well, he found it outside. Oh, well, you ain't that careless with your hat and coat, are you, kiddo? No, I guess not. Well, come here over here. Here, take a look. <laughs> That's it. That's the one. It's all yours, kiddo. Oh, thanks, Katie. I sure appreciate it. Hey, wait a minute. Let's have the check. A check? Yeah, a check. You take the suitcase, Katie takes a check. That's how we play around here. But I told you, the watchman found it outside. He brought it in here for me to pick up. He said he if I... He didn't leave me no notes or anything. I'm sorry. There's no check, no suitcase. Katie, I've got to have that suitcase. Well, i got to have a check or a note from the watchman. Here. Will ten dollars take care of it? Ten bucks. Are hey, you kidding? This bag's worth more than that. Oh, my. Here's twenty. Hey, you sure wanted that, huh? What's in it? Oh, just some personal things. That's all, huh? Yeah, usual stuff. Shirts, handkerchiefs, odds and ends. Nothing else, huh? Katie, it's none of your business what's in that bag. Just take the money and give me the suitcase. Take it easy, kiddo. I gotta be sure who gets what around here. Now, you ain't got a check... And you won't tell me what's in this thing. And how am I supposed to know for sure if it belongs to you? All right. It's filled with papers. Business papers. Well, now that's a lot better, comrade. Oh. Okay, oh. fellas, this is the guy. Thanks, Katie. All right, let's go. Wait a minute. What is it? Don't argue. Let's go. And take the suitcase with you. The two men led me to a car waiting outside. I sat between them in the front seat as we traveled across town to a quiet residential section of the city. Both of the men were ominously silent all the way, and I knew there were no questions I could ask them. Secretly, though, I wondered how Katie fit into the party apparatus, and how the truth of my motives had gotten back to common pleasure. We stopped in front of a small, vine-covered bungalow. The sort of place you see in the ads in women's magazines. But the charm of this house was wasted on me now. I could see only its sinister aspects. This way. Wait in here. Go on. The room was furnished comfortably. Inexpensive, but tasteful. It was the average American family's extra room, the den, complete with chairs, a chess set, books, phonograph. There was a small desk to flatter a man's desire for an office at home, and a studio couch for the overnight guest. I waited and wondered about my status as a guest in this house, and the sort of hospitality I could expect. Well, Savetti, welcome home. Was it? Beaker. <laughs> Brother, am I glad to see you. I'm sorry if the boys worried you, Matt. Only a few of us in the FBI know what you're really doing. Yeah. Well, as long as you don't forget, I'll be okay. We won't. Don't worry. That suitcase you brought us will solve a lot of problems. There should be enough stuff in those papers to deport Plevna and a lot more like him. Good. Hey, how did you get a line on the suitcase? Well, the girl at the bowling alley. What's her name? Katie. Yeah. She opened it, saw the commie papers, and called the cops. The cops called the FBI. I didn't think we'd be picking you up, but... Well, it's nice to see you again, Matt. Thanks, Beaker. Wish you could stay. I really do. So do I, Beaker. So do I. I walked away from Beaker's home and down the quiet street. A dog barked in a yard nearby. A little girl sang a rope-skipping song. A lawnmower clattered across the grass. These were the sounds I missed most of all. But I kept on walking, walking back to the fury of red fanatics who cheered for violence. I was walking away from the sound of peace. No wonder I walked alone. will return in just a moment.
This is Dana Andrews again. In the story you just heard, names, dates, and places are fictitious to protect innocent persons. Many of these stories are based on incidents in the life of Matt Savetic, who worked undercover for the FBI. Next week, another fantastic adventure. Join us then, won't you? Thank <laughs> you.